The United States has great strength and patience. But if it is forced to defend itself or its allies, we will have no choice but to totally destroy North Korea. Homefront, the revolution. Now, this is a game that received some pretty negative reviews when it came out, with some people going as far as to say that it's the worst game of 2016. And it definitely seems like the developers were aware of their own mediocrity, because in the opening of the credits, there is a passage which can only be described as an apology. To summarize it, ah, you win some, you lose some, you know. But my personal favorite extract from this is the closing statement, which says, Finally, for all of you that have enjoyed playing this game, I promise you, this is just the beginning. Written by Hasit Zala, who has since left the company. But superficially, the game doesn't look that bad. I mean, at worst, it looks kind of generic, but honestly, nothing terrible is jumping out at me. Even the main menu looks pretty good. It's got this nice minimalist thing going on, and... Oh, 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 and mm. Ah, um, mm, not a fan of that noise. And oh, yeah, it happens every time you click on anything. Good, that's, yeah, that's great. And oh, it, it just keeps going. Mm-hmm, good. I gotta be honest, if you're pissing me off with the main menu noises, you're not off to a great start. Ah, but anyway, let's just start the game and see what all the fuss is about. We are immediately given an exposition dump which tells us a number of things. Most importantly, Apple was actually made in North Korea, and apparently they did it better because they had iPads out by 2004. Turns out the Americans love iPads because they kept buying from the North Koreans and got into some pretty extreme national debt. And instead of pussyfooting around the matter, North Korea just straight up invaded them. And because they had control over all of the American tech, they just completely annihilated the United States. So, uh, Korea wins. And you're playing a guy called Ethan Brady, who is a rebel in occupied Philadelphia. And you're just trying to do all the typical rebel stuff, you know, sleuthing about, shooting people, getting hit by hammers, etc. And then, after that exposition dump, we just start playing and... Wow, the first thing I notice is the pure visual quality of this game. It looks stunning. I mean, YouTube compression and video rendering will completely massacre it, so by the time you see it, I may as well be playing Wolfenstein 3D. But just take my word for it, this game looks incredible. And the second major thing that hits me is the fact that this is very clearly a Far Cry clone. It's got the same gameplay, it's got the same presentation, it's got the same general objectives. This is straight up a Far Cry ripoff. However, it's not as simple as that. There are some delicious twists to enjoy in this story. So let's take a look at the history of Far Cry. It was developed by a company called Crytek. After Far Cry 1, Ubisoft purchased the IP and made use of Crytek's engine, the Cry Engine, which they modified to make the later Far Cry games. Now, Homefront The Revolution was developed by Dambuster Studios, a subsidiary of Deep Silver. But the game began development under Dambuster's predecessor, Crytek UK, a subsidiary of, well, Crytek, the original developers of Far Cry. And Homefront is running on the Crytek engine. So considering its lineage, is it really a Far Cry ripoff? Yes, yeah, yeah it is, that changes nothing. And the third major thing I noticed about this game was the audio mixing. It is whack as hell, homies. Why, why did I say that? <laughs> Just listen to this scene from the game's intro. They got Walker. What do we do? This changes oh, no. nothing. You hear me? I can't believe it. Others will rise it's up. Walker. You can't God. stop. Ah! Yeah, I, I really wanted to know what homeless Philadelphia number six had to say about the matter. Screw the actual event. And other than these three major things, nothing really jumped out at me. The game was very generic. Not necessarily in a bad way. I can deal with some generic games every so often. But I couldn't understand why this game got such universally meh reviews. There are a few other little pedantic issues I had with the game, like the flashlight sensitivity is kind of whack. I mean, look at this, the horizontal sensitivity is way higher than the vertical one, so you just start flinging it around all over the place. But I also have to praise it, because the flashlight is way more effective than it is in other games. You know, where you get the 8 centimeters of light, and then everything else is pitch blackness. So at this point in note-taking, I kind of considered stopping this, and choosing another game to talk about instead, but I decided to push on, because I just had to figure out why so many people hated this game. And I mean, good news, it's now a three-parter. So let's just go through the story and see what happens. So our friend gets captured, we go through some tunnels, we find the good guys! Yes! The good guys start torturing us. 
No! But then they realize, oh no! He's the protagonist. We can't torture the protagonist. He needs to kill some Koreans. And then we start killing Koreans. And I'm gonna keep saying Koreans rather than North Koreans just for the sake of brevity. So, you know, don't worry, South Korea. I'm not trying to kill you. And in killing these Koreans, I note that the gameplay is, uh... It's fine. Hell, I would even say it's pretty good. Responsive controls, satisfying combat, decent vehicle maneuvering, standard crafting system. People called this the worst game of 2016? I mean, it has nothing new, and I'm sure some things were changed with updates, but this is perfectly acceptable. A few bugs here and there, but nothing too criminal. And in fact, a few aspects of the game are better than average. For example, the level design. It's got buildings to climb, tunnels to slink through, ramps to ramp on. And most importantly, my favorite thing, creepy little hidey holes. But above all else, I was massively impressed by an often underutilized aspect of level design. Clutter, or visual identity, set dressing, whatever you want to call it. I think people underestimate the power and importance of clutter. Having stuff just spread ambiently throughout your levels does so much to add to the character and depth of your environments. A wonderful example of this, and yes, I'm mentioning it again, is in Amnesia The Dark Descent. If you're playing Painticus Bingo, you can tick that square. Just try to imagine Brennenberg without all of the boxes, rocks, bottles, limbs, books, and just general trash that you can toy around with. They serve no purpose. Well, the limbs do serve a purpose, but the rest of them don't really serve a purpose. They're just there to give the area character. And yeah, Homefront excels at this. There's so much stuff in every level you go to that's just lying around. If they were going for the war-torn city feel, they achieved it. Or maybe they were just going for modern-day Philadelphia. They achieved that as well. If you're like me and you're a casual completionist type, these kinds of Far Cry clones are pretty satisfying. Coloring the map blue, blowing stuff up, and customizing your weapons and armor is all around a good time. And the game grants you the freedom to do this. So, uh, where are the problems? Well, I did note this one pretty major one. The AI are a little slow. They'll sometimes get stuck on each other, or stuck on stairs, or not react to you, or run into fire, and other similar problems, and the friendly AI isn't much better. I mean, just look at this guy, he's not even wearing any goddamn shoes. And every so often, a tank or a sniper will just sort of disappear. But we've all lost some tanks in our lifetimes, can we really blame them? What I'm trying to say is, bugs are present and bugs are noticeable. But there's not really anything I would consider to be game-breaking or really that affecting in any sense. Most of the problems are pretty minor, other than one time when I got stuck behind two NPCs who decided just not to move during a scripted event, which means I couldn't continue with the story, but you know, reloading a checkpoint from like 30 seconds before fixed that, so, you know, it's not that bad. Should we expect our games to be more or less bug-free? Yes, I definitely think so but the market leaders disagree. You're gonna find some pretty similar bugs, if not worse bugs, in most AAA games. And this game isn't even a AAA game, it's like a 1.5 A game. And I do understand that I'm playing this game three years after it came out, so a lot of bug fixes will have been implemented alongside the release of DLC and whatnot. So yeah, at release the game was probably a lot worse. But I'm not here to judge a game that came out three years ago in the context of three years ago. I'm here to judge a game that came out three years ago in the context of today. And as of today, this is fine. Now anyway, getting back to the game. I used the phrase painting the map blue a minute ago. So for those who don't know what that means, by doing certain tasks, capturing areas, capturing other areas, and, uh, and capturing areas, parts of the map will move from North Korean control to United States control. Other games have used similar systems, most notably Grand Theft Auto, San Andreas, with the whole gang territory system. But Homefront has an interesting little twist on that. There are two types of areas, red zones and yellow zones. Red zones are your typical Far Cry style, hostile environment, shoot on sight type places. But yellow zones are ones where the Koreans have already won and you can take two options with these. You can play saboteur and sneak around doing stuff all stealthy-like, or you can just go nuts and guerrilla warfare your way through the zones. And you can swap between the two playstyles on a whim. This is a really cool way to do this. It's a neat little change-up of the formula, and it really supports the theme of oppressed rebel fighters really well. One of the things other than bugs that this game was criticized for are its characters, and that is very much fair. They're mostly forgettable. 
But there's one exception to this, that being the character Sam Burnett. So he's one of the revolution lads, but he's an unwavering pacifist, especially when it comes to innocent civilians. This sounds fairly standard, but it's the way he fits into the story that's interesting. In most narratives, he would be used as the player's moral compass and would eventually be used to embody some great peace that solves everything and presents a nice make love not war type message. But not here. He's instead presented as the flawed idealist, someone who wants US freedom without bloodshed. And while a diplomatic option may eventually present itself, it's pretty unlikely, considering the Koreans have already started building massive walls and concentration camps. So Sam represents that cultural norm where people expect the best without having to deal with any of the consequences. And the developers took the extremely grim, but hauntingly realistic approach of sometimes innocent people have to die. I look into the future, Brady, and in that uncertain darkness, I see a vast constellation of light. The good deeds, the joy, and the love that will be spread by all of us as we travel our lives. Each death in this conflict extinguishes those lights, and the future darkens for all of us. Now, other games have tackled this issue in the past, but goddamn, this game unapologetically takes its side and sticks to it. Now, whenever I play an FPS, or more specifically, a military shooter, I try to pinpoint the exact moment where they jump the shark. Now, here's a few famous examples of other games that have done this. Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, when you launch a nuke into space. Call of Duty Black Ops, when the story turns into a meth-fueled Alex Jones rant. Call of Duty Advanced Warfare, when it turned out the antagonist was a goddamn diddler. So, uh, basically any Call of Duty game past the third one will do. And I was almost certain that this game would have a shark jumping moment. And boy, did I find it. Some people would claim that the very premise of this game is itself jumping the shark. Because, you know, having North Korea occupy a country with a population of 0.35 billion people. But, you know, I can suspend my disbelief for stuff like that, so I say the shark jumping moment is when you steal a Korean AI super tank. Because, you know, there's something about super tanks that doesn't really fit in with my idea of an underdog revolutionary story. Oh, but it's okay, because then you have to take the super tank on the world's worst escort quest, and it's revealed this is no super tank. This tank is absolute dog shit because it gets stuck on absolutely everything on the map. In fact, it's not even the tank that's the main problem. This entire mission is cursed. I got stuck inside a building that I wasn't meant to go inside. This happened? I don't even know what that is. And things are floating in the air. What's going on? The trick with jumping the shark is, you have to actually go with it. If I'm stealing a magic super tank from some Koreans, I want to use the magic super tank. I don't want to bring it on an escort quest. In Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, after launching the nuke, you get a really cool post-nuke mission. In that, you're like dodging falling helicopters and none of your electronics work and it's very cinematic and it's a big set-piece mission and it's very cool. In this, I'm just calibrating a tank. This is the stuff that's meant to happen off screen. So I'd usually be telling you a bit more about what's actually going on in this story, but it's pretty much what you can imagine. We kill Koreans, we build up a revolution, we kill some more Koreans. Oh no, there's a traitor. Oh no, it's an ambush. It's nothing you haven't seen before. The game's narrative was criticized quite heavily when it came out and I can see why. It's not bad, it's just not good. You won't remember it. It doesn't have the theatrics of a Call of Duty game, the exotic setting of a Far Cry game, or the uniqueness of something like a Stalker game. It is entirely underwhelming. Honestly, the most interesting part of the story is the setting, Philadelphia, which I guess they chose because it's so closely tied to the original American Revolution. But when I think about Philadelphia, I do not think about patriotism. I think about drugs, murder, and it's always sunny, so the symbolism is largely lost on me. Around 10 or so hours into the game, I begin to realize why people might complain about the gameplay. It's got the classic Ubisoft gameplay loop of capture a thing, kill some people, capture another thing, maybe do something else, capture a thing, kill some people, repeat until the end of the game. Personally, this doesn't really bother me. If the gameplay is smooth, and I maintain that this game's gameplay is smooth, I can keep playing repetitive stuff so long as it's clear that I'm making some kind of progress. But I also understand not everyone's like me, so if that seems like it would bore you, avoid this game. So the question remains, despite the mixed reviews, uninspired gameplay, or maybe too inspired gameplay, criticized narrative and technical hiccups, why did I buy this game? Well, this arcade machine is why I bought this game. But what is this arcade machine? 
What is Painticus talking about? Is he referring to himself in the third person? Find out all of these questions and more next time on this channel. I'll be honest, I should probably start scripting the outros to my videos rather than just kind of rolling with it. In any case, thanks very much for watching, and goodbye.